just very quickly to get back into this subject, we, we've talked about last time the four categories of the Old Testament books. All I'm going to do is show you these four. We're not going to talk about them really at all. But there are four categories of Old Testament books. We're going to start in the promises of God tonight. In the book of Genesis, I just want to show you where Genesis comes from, where, which type of book it is, which category it falls into. So we have the chronological books. There are 11 of those that trace the history of Israel from creation in the garden all the way to the last days of Israel uh, before that 400-year silence. We have a complementary books that uh, tell certain stories, bring, give certain color to the things that the chronological books don't speak of. We have wisdom books in the Bible, four of those, and we have prophetic books. All the major prophets, all the minor prophets, all written down on that sheet. Well, Genesis obviously starts out the chronological books. It's the very first historical book covers more ground as far as years go in its 50 chapters than any other book in the Scripture. Uh, Genesis covers thousands of years of human history. So we start at the beginning in the chronological book of Genesis. The theme that we're going to be tracing, I've said this several times, I'll say it again, is the promise, God as a promise keeper. God as a promise maker, God as a promise keeper. Uh, so we're trying to learn more about God as we walk through these things. That's why we're doing this. Uh, we're trying to learn more about God Himself by looking at the promise, this, promises that He's made to mankind. Now realize this, God chose to do this. He chose to communicate to us in this way. He didn't have to make a single promise to anyone. He didn't have to do this. But it was the way that He chose to communicate Himself to man to, uh, to show, to reveal His character to man, uh, He chose to make promises and to keep promises. And we would learn about His character by His dealings with mankind. So He didn't have to promise man anything, but He chose to make promises. He chose to keep promises because He knew that that would teach us about His character, about who He is, how He exists. He's a promise keeper. He makes promises to man as we'll start to see tonight, and we get to see as we trace the Bible, as we continue reading the Bible, we get to see whether God keeps His promises or not. And when we see that God keeps every promise that He makes, uh, we, it builds our trust in Him. It, it makes Him reliable. It makes Him trustworthy. Obviously, He's existed forever as reliable and trustworthy, but He has chosen to teach us that He is reliable and trustworthy in the way that He spelled out the Scriptures in, keeping, in making and keeping promises. This is the word, the Hebrew word for promise. We haven't talked about it yet. It's the word diber. It's D-I-B-E-R. Uh, and interesting, if you change the vowels to dabar, dibir, diber, uh, it all means to speak. We have it translated, God promised Sarah. God promised Abraham, and this is the Hebrew word that's there uh, for promise. It means to speak, just to, to simply speak, to talk something, uh, to talk something out. It also means to pronounce, to make a pronouncement, and it also means when we speak in terms of God, it means to make a promise, which is very interesting to me because when God speaks to mankind, Everything he speaks is as if a man is making a promise. All God has to do is utter a statement. But because of his character, because of his veracity, because of his perfect truth, because he knows all things, everything that God speaks to man is a promise. Uh, it's a weighable promise, a fulfillable promise because of the character that he has. So a couple of thoughts about that. Everything God says to man is a promise because of his character of perfect truthfulness. God doesn't have to say, I promise if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. He doesn't have to say the words, I promise, the way you and I do. Because if he says it, 
It's a declared promise out of the mouth of God because he can tell no lies. It's all truthful. He doesn't have to say that to us. So everything God says to man is a promise because of his character, of per his character, characteristic, I should have said, of perfect truthfulness, his veracity. Every word God utters is true and will come true. He simply doesn't have to qualify himself as a promise maker. He simply has to speak. Uh, As we'll see tonight when he makes the first promise in Genesis chapter 2, he doesn't say, Adam, I promise you. He just speaks. He speaks a command to Adam and it's as if uh, it's, it's equal to us having to say, I promise. But every word God utters is a promise because of His perfections. Every word He utters is accurate based on His perfect knowledge. He's omniscient. So everything that comes out of the mouth of God is perfectly true, always has been, is today, and always will be. That's the God. This is the way he's teaching us of his character uh, through the way he writes these things in the scriptures. All these things I could show you in chapter, ver- chapter and verse where God says he's perfect truthfulness, where he's perfectly omniscient. He knows all things. Every word man utters. In contrast to God, every word man utters is not true and not accurate. I'm not saying no word that man utters is true and accurate. I'm saying not every word that man uh, utters is true and accurate because we aren't, are not, perfectly truthful or perfectly knowledgeable. So man has a problem. I can't simply say something and you uh, hold it as perfect truth and perfect accuracy. God can. And everything he utters is perfectly true. Even when man makes a promise, and we promise things all the time, even when man makes a promise, it's only as binding, as reliable, as the character of the man making the promise. There are some people that would make a promise to you, and you know, you know, while the words are coming out of their mouth, this will never, ever happen. It will never come to pass. Because we know people's character. So even when man makes a promise, it's only as binding as the character of the man making the promise. That's not so with God. Every word he says is binding. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. It's true. It's accurate. Every word he says is accurate. And so when we pick this thing up and we call this, what is it? The Word of God... We know that every word in this, because God spoke this book, the Bible says that it was breathed out by God, that God the Holy Spirit bore men along as they wrote the Scriptures, the way wind pushes on the sail of a sailboat. There's God the Holy Spirit, that wind pushing uh, pushing the writer of the Scriptures forward. Working together, no question, but the Holy Spirit doing the pushing but uh, So the Word of God then, we can, we can make or we can read statements like this that God says about His Bible. Because it's His words and we've determined that everything God says is accurate, truthful, reliable. We read this in Psalm 119 verse 89 about the Bible itself. The psalmist says, Forever, O Lord, forever your word is settled in heaven. Because the other part of God's character that I didn't mention is this idea of uh, immutability. He can't change. So he's already written this book to us. We know that it's his words written through the pens of a man, through the, the pens of men, but every word of this book is settled forever because he has spoken it, it's trustworthy, it's reliable, it's accurate, it's true. And because he doesn't change, this book will never change. We'll be in heaven 10 billion years, if we count years. We'll be somewhere for 10 billion years and be able to quote this verse because it'll be as true then as it is today. 
It will not be altered. He won't say, you know what? I didn't like the way I wrote it the first time. I'm going to delete a few words. I'm going to rewrite. There's no need for that. Out of the mouth of God comes purity and truth. So that's what we have here when we look at the Scripture. God describing Himself in the Bible. Uh, even though He used men to write the book, it's God describing Himself, God revealing Himself to mankind in this book. He tells us, He breathes out through human writers what He wants us to know about Him. Everything God thinks that... No, God knows, not thinks. I think God knows. But everything that He knows that will fully equip us for this life, He has determined fits inside this book. This is God's plan. That everything any human being needs to know about me, about themselves, about how to live, how to be saved, how to live, everything they need, I've written in this one book. There's no further information that a man needs in order to grow spiritually and please me in his every thought, word, and deed. That's what this book is. It's a revelation, a revealing of God. So he tells us in the Bible not only what he wants us to know, but he has to limit the information to this one little book because he can only tell us right now with these brains, he can only tell us what he knows we can understand. God's an infinitely omniscient God. These 66 books, I mean, we can't, it doesn't even scratch the surface of the wisdom of the eternal wisdom of God. It's simply what man can grasp with the minds that he's given us. That's what this book is. Barely, barely, barely nicking the knowledge and the wisdom of what God is and what he knows. But that's what he's chosen. 66 books. Everything has purpose. There's perfect, per perfect purpose in everything God does. It's, there's no mistake that He chose the writers that He did. There's no mistake that they all have their own writing style. They all have their own backgrounds. We have farmers. We have doctors. We have uh, fishermen. We have tax collectors. And every one of those writers, just because of who they are, every one of us is uh, attached to maybe more to one than the other. I happen to be a guy that loves Peter. I love that fisherman Peter. I love First and Second Peter. I love the way Peter writes. I love the way he thinks. I think because he and I are, are, have similarities, sim, similar human characteristics, Peter and I. I like, to, I like the way he writes. Um, I'd say I don't like certain writers of the Scripture, but that, edge is, uh, that, that gets right up to the edge of blasphemy, doesn't it? Uh, but I prefer some of the writers of the Scriptures. I like the way they write. They all have their own style. So God chose these writers of Scripture very, very carefully. It's very interesting that we have not only one witness to Jesus' life in Matthew, the tax collector, but we have another witness in Jesus' life, Luke the doctor. We have a third witness to Jesus' life, Mark this young man, uh, and then we have a fourth witness to Jesus' life, John. Very interesting that God would write something for the Greeks, for the Romans, for the Jews, because He knows we all learn differently. We all have different, uh, different likes and dislikes, different things we're attracted to. He wrote the Bible for us that way. He made these minds and, because He knew that He would write this book. So, all understandable. All understandable. Nothing is left to chance. His plan's complete. It lacks nothing. It's perfect. Every detail is in place. We find out from the scriptures when we read it that God is a storytelling teacher. Narrative in the Bible. There's more narrative in this book. Stories. He did this and then he said that. He responded this way. Then she came into the picture. Then the mother-in-law came. The stories all over the scripture. God is a storytelling teacher teacher. It's like a good grandfather. He likes to tell stories. He's written this book, uh, the, the majority of this book, in narrative style. The book of Jonah. The book, I mean, we could go on and on about his narratives, just storytelling. Uh, all factual, but let me tell you about Joseph. 
and his t- and his his brothers that sold him into slavery. Let me tell you about Pharaoh and how I hardened Pharaoh's heart. Let me tell you about the ten plagues, and it's all these story after story, all these promises interwoven into the stories. We're in the book of Judges, twenty uh, something chapters of storyline. So he's a storytelling teacher. Most of the Bible is storytelling, and again, God chose this. God chose this. He chose to teach us about Himself in this, in this style of writing, and He also chose us to teach, about, teach us about Himself by making promises. He's chosen to make promises and keep promises to teach man about his character. The first promise God makes to man is a condition of obedience. We're going to read what the promise is in just a minute. In Genesis chapter 2, you can eat everything in the garden, from all the trees, all the shrubs, all the bushes, everything that gives off fruit, everything that gives off vegetables, all of it is for you, but you cannot eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. That's the first promise in the Bible. The first promise God makes to man is a condition of obedience. Why? What is God teaching through these promises? What is God teaching Adam, I almost said Noah, what is God teaching Adam in the garden through this conditional promise? I'm the creator. I make the rules. Let's get the groundwork. uh, Let's get the groundwork right. I'm the creator. You're the creature, Adam. I have the right to make the rules. You must obey them. That's it. I'm the creator. I make the rules. So God is creator and makes it very clear in this first promise to Adam a condition of obedience, that He is the Creator of all things and that He makes the rules. Imagine being Adam. Imagine, just for a minute, being Adam. Try to put your mind in Adam's mind. One second you don't exist, and the next second you're a 30-something-year-old grown man who stands up in this perfect Eden, this perfect garden, There's no other human being around you, and it wouldn't help anyway because you don't know what human being is. You don't know what all these animals are walking around. You don't know what these things are that that have these brown circular trunks and have this greenery coming. You don't know anything about anything. Nothing. And God walks in to start to teach you. And so what does God have to teach Adam? I just created you. I made you from the dust of the earth. I scooped you up. You are dust. That's what I made you from. I would love to have been there in those first hours after God created Adam just to hear what he told Adam. But no doubt, part of what he told him is, I'm the creator who just gave you existence. I gave you life so that you could worship me and glorify me. And I make the rules, not you. I've made you to be my ambassador. I've made you to be my representative. I'm going to give you control of all the earth. You'll eventually name the animals. You'll have control over everything. I put you in a garden to tend the land, to get produce from the land, to work the land. You will be my representative on earth. I've made you in my image and my likeness. Nothing else you see. Nothing else you see is made in my image and my likeness. Nothing. You're the only thing on earth. And by the way, Adam, this thing you're standing on, that's called earth. I just can't imagine all the learning Adam had to do early, early, early in his existence. Man must follow rules. Adam learned it the hard way. Man must follow God's rules in order for the relationship between Creator God and mankind to be maintained. Everything is perfect right now. The fruit grows on the trees. The vegetables grow from the ground. Everything is perfect. The water is pure. You can drink from any stream of water. You can drink any water you can find. 
Everything is perfect. The relationship is perfect. God, it says in the scriptures, that God would walk with Adam in the cool of the day, that he would come through the garden and walk with Adam, no doubt teaching him. And so what is one of the things Adam had to learn? What is God telling him? What do we learn from the Bible about God? That He's the Creator, He makes the rules, and ours is but to, uh, but to do or die. We have to follow the rules in order for the relationship with the Creator to be maintained. God sets conditions. God sets conditions and consequences that man can clearly understand. Again... If the Bible is of no value to anybody if it's not understandable. If we as pastors can't make it understandable, and if the sheep, God's sheep, can't understand it, then the church is of no value. We have to make the Scripture understandable. God had to make the Scripture understandable to Adam, and so God set a condition and also a consequence for breaking that condition that Adam clearly understood. On the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. God often communicates these conditions and consequences in the form of a promise. And that's exactly what we see right here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, the first of these promises promises that God would make mankind. Do this, and this is the result. Do this over here, and this is the consequence. Blessing, cursing, from the very first moments in the garden. God often communicates these conditions and consequences in the form of a promise. And that's what we will spend the next umpteen weeks of our lives on these night sessions going through the Bible, looking for God's promises. In Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, this is what God said. This is what says, uh, this is what this first of the chronological books, the book of Genesis says to us. This is what God chose to communicate about himself to us. This is what he wrote in the Bible. Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, commanded the man from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was one tree that God had determined was the tree. He created it to be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to test Adam, to test Eve. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from that tree you shall not eat. Let's go over point one and two again, Adam. I am the creator who created you to glorify me, and you are the creature. And I make the rules. Son, this is the rule. The only rule in the garden. Can you imagine having just one rule? From the knowledge of the tree of good and evil you shall not eat, and here is the promise, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. God makes a promise. Of course, Satan was in the garden, wasn't he? Satan was in the garden watching, listening, hearing what God is teaching these new people, these new humans, this brand new creation from the dust. And what does Satan do shortly after that? We don't know what time period went by between the, the command and the, the consequence given by God in Genesis 2.16. And the fall of man in Genesis 3, we don't have a date there. We don't know. Was it a year? Was it a week? Was it a hundred years? We don't know. God doesn't give us any clue because we don't need to know. Because if it was important and God needed us to know it, then what would we have in the Bible? He would have told us that. But He didn't. He chose to write the Scripture without that fact. But Satan is in the garden, and this is what Satan says. Again, look at what God says. In the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And Satan comes into the garden, and what does he attack? The Word of God. Nothing new under the sun. 
What does Satan attack? The very words that God breathed out. On the day you eat, you will surely die. And the serpent said to Eve, the woman, you surely will not die. All he did was add one little word. The rest of it is pure Bible. All he did, everything looks good. Boy, all of that, that whole thing you just said sounds exactly like what God said. Because God said, you will surely die. It's so, uh, so familiar to my ear. And all he did was attack one little word, you shall surely not die. He added not to it. Uh, notice that he didn't attack Eve physically. He didn't try to kill her in the garden. Obviously, he couldn't. God wouldn't let him. But he didn't attack her physically. Where did he attack her? He attacked her in her intellect. He attacked her in her thinking. He attacked her in what she thought and believed about the Word of God. It wasn't written down yet, but make no mistake, it is the Word of God. It was the verbal Word of God. We have it now written down as the written Word of God, what God told her. And Adam came to attack the Bible knowledge that she had. Do you think it's important that we don't know the Bible accurately? What do we see in this story? I'm not going to read it, but Eve paraphrased the Bible. He said we couldn't eat it or touch it. That's not what he said. Why didn't Eve go? I, I don't know how they transmitted it, but my thought for today would be, why are you paraphrasing the Bible when you have one? Pick that thing up and open it up and read from the page. That's why a lot of times I'll get ready to say a scripture and I'll say, no, just wait a second. Let me turn to it because I don't want to botch it. I don't want to miss any words. I want to say it. I want to speak it the way God wrote it down in the scripture. And Eve missed and Satan said, aha. So he goes into the garden. He attacks the Bible. God has made a promise. On the day you eat from the tree, you will surely die. Satan says, you will not die. So now we have the decision. God, is He reliable? Is He trustworthy? Can I trust what He said? Is He really trying to keep me from something? Satan says, yes, He's trying to keep you from the knowledge of good and evil. He knows that on the day you eat of the tree, you will become like Him, knowing good from evil. Eve looks at the fruit in the next couple of verses. In Genesis 3, verse 6, this is how the story continues. When Eve, I call her Eve, not the woman. She's Ish in the Bible, the Hebrew word for woman. But when the woman Eve saw that the tree was good for food. Interesting also to me that God made this tree beautiful. He made the fruit desirable. It wasn't some withered, thorny, ugly fruit like, a, like an olive or something that to me just doesn't look like anything. It was something that was very delightful to her. The woman saw that the tree was good for food so it could be eaten. It was that Whatever that is on there, that fruit is edible because it looks a lot like that fruit on that tree and I eat from that tree all the time. So she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. See, it's, it's meeting, meeting every one of her uh, lusts. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All here in these uh, few moments, Eve looking at the fruit. So she saw that it was good for food. She saw that it was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Satan's got her. I want to be wise. So she took from its fruit and she ate. And she also, it says, and she also or gave also to her husband, Adam, who was with her, the scripture says, and he ate. Now, when you read these words and you parse them out in the Hebrew, it seems as if Adam was present the whole time Eve was having this conversation with Satan. He was with her. She didn't have to go find Adam in the garden because he was doing wonderful things for Yahweh. All she had to do was say, here, honey, take a bite. Because he was there. And what did he do? He ate. So the big question remains, after God has made this first promise to man, 
to reveal His character to us, the question is, will He actually kill Adam? Will He do what He said He was going to do? Adam has now eaten from the tree. Will He kill Adam? Will He actually kill Adam? Will He keep His word? And we know, you don't see it immediately here, but we know from the rest of the Scripture that Adam, at the instant he bit that fruit, the second his teeth broke through the skin of that fruit, he died spiritually. He didn't die physically. The penalty for the sin wasn't physical death. The penalty that God imposed when He said, You will surely die was at that moment, you, your human spirit will cease to exist. He created Adam, a body, a soul, and a spirit, just the way believers are today. And at the second Adam bit the fruit, his spirit died. Paradise was lost. And he would soon be expelled from the Garden of Eden. Remember the cherubim with their flaming swords would be kept at the gate of the... Uh, at the Garden of Eden so that Adam and Eve couldn't go back in and eat from the other tree, the tree of life, and remain in that lost condition forever. So paradise was lost. Again, the penalty for sin, the penalty for Adam eating the fruit was spiritual death. It was the idea of being separated from God for eternity. And Adam died spiritually the instant he ate that fruit. Look what it says. In the next few verses, Genesis 3, 17. Is God going to kill Adam? The answer is absolutely. It's already been done. By the time God comes into the Adam and he uh, comes into the garden, God goes to Adam. He finds him. He's naked. He pronounces curses on, serp on the serpent, Satan. Then he pronounces a curse on Eve. And then he turns to Adam and pronounces curses not only on Adam, but on Eve everything He created that God had created. The whole earth is cursed, according to Romans chapter 8. It groans waiting for the day the curse is lifted. To Adam, God said this, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. That was the promise. Because when you do, you will die. God says, cursed is the ground because of you. The entire earth, in toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It's no longer going to be easy. It's no longer going to be like the Garden of Eden, where every tree, every branch is just filled with fruit, so, so much so that the branches are just heavy laden with the fruit. It's not going to be like that anymore, Adam. You blew it. You changed the topography of the earth. You changed the, so the nature of the soil. You changed animals. You changed everything. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life. And look at the next couple of verses. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. They're not just going to pop up. You're going to have to go out there and by the sweat of your face you will eat bread. So all of a sudden, to get grain from the ground that's ground up to make a flour which makes bread, all of a sudden, sudden it was going to be not work, but hard work. Because the plants aren't going to be what they were before you bit the fruit. The ground isn't going to give the nutrients that it did before you bit the fruit. Everything was changed. And this is what God says to Adam. The question is, will God keep the promise that He made? Will He actually kill Adam? Part of the answer has already been answered. Yes, He's already spiritually dead and separated from God. But what about His body? He says, by the sweat of your face, God speaking to Adam, you will eat bread until you return to the ground because from it you were taken... Remember that dust of the earth, from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Another promise of God. 
So the question still remains, will God take Adam's physical life? What's Adam's future here? Because not only does Adam exist as spiritual life when he's created, but he also exists as physical life. Is God going to squelch all of it? And the answer is found a couple of chapters later in Genesis 5. This is what it says. So we have another promise from God. You're already spiritually dead. You've already cursed the earth. I've cursed it because of your disobedience, but you're still physically alive. And in Genesis 5, this is what we read in verses 3, 4, and 5. When Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and he named him Seth. Then, after having birthed Seth, fathered Seth, then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years. And he had other sons and other daughters. And look at what the scripture says in Genesis chapter 5. So all the days that Adam lived physically were 930 years. And there's the phrase at the end, and he died. The promise God made to Adam in the garden, if you look at Genesis 5, if you're there... It goes after, uh, it, it, it harkens back to the promise of Genesis 2. When you eat from the tree, you will surely die. And everybody that comes after you will die also. And so when you get into Genesis chapter 5, it talks about Adam and he died. It talks about Seth. Uh, begetting Enosh, and then it says, and he died. And then it talks about Enosh begetting his children. And at the end of the verse, it says, and he died. And then it talks about Canaan living. And at the end of that, he says, and he died. In verse 17, and he died. Verse 20, and he died. Verse um, 27, and he died. And he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Because our God, friends is a promise maker and a promise keeper. In the very beginning of the book, God says there are consequences for sin. I'm the creator. I make the rules. I write the Bible. You obey. And the consequences are dire. God kept His promise completely. We saw in Genesis 3, 6, and He ate. And we see in Genesis 5, 5, and He died. Because that's exactly what God said would occur. So spiritual death was the penalty of that eating of the fruit. Physical death was a consequence of spiritual death. And it took Adam's body in that perfect earth or corrupt earth uh, but not as corrupt as it is now. It took his body 930 years to fail. And finally he died. Genesis 21, verse 1 and 2. No, I don't want to go there. It's 716. We'll close in prayer. Next week we're going to go to the next promise in the Bible that is significant enough to talk about in the whole session. What's that promise? We have a spiritually dead Adam in the garden. What's the next promise we're going to go to? But I'm going to save you. I'm going to send a deliverer and I'm going to save you. Not only you, Adam, I'm going to save. I'm going to make it possible for every son, every human daughter born in your likeness, born according to your image, I'm going to make it possible for everyone to be saved. We go to Genesis 3.15 the seed of the woman promise. Let's close in prayer.